Welcome to Modern Life is Goodish. I'm Dave Gorman. I've got a big screen, a laptop and a remote control. And this evening, I want to start by asking you a question. Do you ever see an advert and think, that's not aimed at me? Not only is it not aimed at me, I don't know who it's aimed at or how it can possibly succeed where it is. This happens in big and small ways. You'll see it in a newsagent's window sometimes. Like a lot of newsagents have a window like that with a selection of adverts or, or like that. And, and certain adverts make complete sense in that environment. Now that might be badly spelled in lots of ways, but it's an advert for a room to let near the shop and that makes complete sense. That is someone selling a barbecue. And somebody who doesn't even know they want a barbecue might see that, 35 quid, think I'll give it a go. So the advert makes complete sense where it is, doesn't it? Someone there, they've got some furniture to sell. Again, makes complete sense. But every now and then, you see something different. You see something like this. <laughs> Wanted, ostrich feathers, top prices paid, and a phone number. What the hell is that about? There has got to be a better way of sourcing ostrich feathers than hoping that someone in East London just happens to have some ostrich feathers. And they were passing the news agents and saw it. Oh, yeah, I'll get rid of them, yeah. I called him up to ask him why he wanted the ostrich feathers. He just went, collage. <laughs> and because I didn't want him to think I was wasting his time, I said, I've got some emu feathers. He went, not for me, mate. <laughs> no idea. It just doesn't make sense. And this happens, like I say, in big and small ways. If you go to the football or if you watch football on TV, you will almost always see, around the perimeter of the stadium, advertising for a company called Raynham Steel. That's all they put on their adverts. A white stripe with the blue writing saying Raynham Steel. No slogan, no logo, nothing. Just the words Raynham Steel. But steel isn't something that you or I are ever going to buy. How many people watching that game are buying steel for million pound construction projects? And sitting there thinking, oh, whose steel do I like the most? <laughs> it's not even the kind of product that you have brand loyalty to, is it? This is their website. Here's what they actually make and sell. They make cold formed circles. They make hot finished squares. They make parallel flange channels. <laughs> They make plates, but probably not the kind of plates we do buy. Does this make sense? Is industrial steel that Nimples buy? I mean, a Ford and a Volkswagen might be pretty much the same, but there are reasons why you might prefer one to another. You don't prefer one steel joist that meets the building regulations to another steel joist that meets the building regulations, do you? Who is madder? The man hoping to find an ostrich feather supplier from a newsagent's window, or the man who owns Raynham Steel, spending hundreds of thousands of pounds a year advertising steel to football fans? It's the ostrich feather man, obviously. <laughs> but that's not important. This sort of thing happens a lot. I always thought that spam understood this. I know we always think of spam as just being an irritant, but think about it from the spammer's point of view for a moment. Imagine that your job is sending spam out to all and sundry. It's untargeted, you don't know who's receiving it, you're sending it out by the millions because it's almost free, and you're just looking for some hits. Now, I hope it goes without saying that most spam email isn't really trying to sell you something. They're trying to steal your information, they're trying to con you in some way. So what they're looking for is an idiot. But how do you find an idiot? If that was the idiot in that bunch there, there's no point sending out a spam email that advertises a product that only those three people want. That's not going to find the idiot in the crowd, is it? What they need to do is send out spam emails that advertise products that almost everybody wants, gives themselves their best chance of success. Because that way, they will find the idiot in the crowd. And spam, I always thought, understood this. Back in the 90s, when I started receiving spam for the first time, the traditional lead topics for spam were always the same. It was always penis enlargement, uh, or printer ink, or luxury watches, and of course, just plain money. People would tell you they can make you lots of money. And this all makes sense. Luxury watches and money, they both really translate as greed. And it's fair to say that 100% of the population have some degree of greed about them. It's just that the idiots will have more. Now, I'm talking about spam back in the 90s, before you could get emails on your smartphone. So basically, everyone who was receiving spam was sitting at a desk with a computer that was connected to a printer. So pretty much 100% of the people receiving that email were, in some way at least, interested in buying printer ink. Penis enlargement, 
Roughly 50% of the population would like penis enlargement. The other 50% know someone they'd like to get it for as a present. Huh? <laughs> in broad terms, that's pretty much 100% of the population who are going to be interested. You just need to now weed out the idiots amongst them. But something has changed in the world of spam. Most people these days don't seem to get very much. I still get loads. I have an old email address that anyone could find on the internet. And for that reason, at some point in time, it started receiving genuinely between 30 and 40,000 spam emails a day, <laughs> which made it very hard to find the six or seven emails that I actually wanted to read. So I gave up on it. But instead of nuking that email address, I kept it as a little spam farm. I like to see what the spammers are doing. I'm curious about their world. Every now and then, just for fun, I log on, I go and have a look at that inbox, and think, oh, that's what the spammers are up to these days. And let me tell you, spam has changed. It's got very weirdly niche in ways that I don't understand. I get spam advertising forklift trucks. <laughs> Who buys forklift trucks? How many people have got the purchasing power within their company to buy forklift trucks? And if you have that power, surely there's a recommended supplier. Just on a show of hands, has anyone in this room ever bought an actual forklift truck? One person down there. <laughs> have you seriously bought one? Yes. And would an email from a, a, a rogue outfit tempt you in any way? No. One in 200 people. That's what they're playing with. That's our experiment right there. And this isn't a one-off, incidentally. This isn't a one-off. Look, I get that. Loads. <laughs> I get loads. Genuinely, forklift spam arrives. And they are not the oddest things in my inbox either. Huh. Yeah. <laughs> no. No, I'm not. No. I am not suffering from a defective vaginal mesh. I don't even know what one is. As far as I can work out, this is some surgical procedure, and this is a terrible thing that has happened to some real people somewhere, mostly in America, it seems. But it must be a knowable number of people it's happened to. It can't be worth scattergunning emails to hundreds of thousands and millions of people in the hope that some of them have this problem. Who is this actually appealing to? And again, there are loads of these. Yeah? This, this is ridiculous, right? A woman receives $5 million settlement. Yeah? That makes sense, but this can't be true. And her husband is awarded $500,000 in mesh recall case. Is that how it works? It can't be, can it? I mean, I can't check. I don't want to ruin my browser history, but that can't. <laughs> that can't be how this works, can it? Something terrible has happened to a woman's Luli, and the courts have seen fit to award her $5 million in compensation because of some malpractice or whatever. That makes sense. That is possible. But the idea that the judge then says, and I'll tell you what, fella, have 10% for yourself, yeah? <laughs> If something terrible happens to my penis and some court awards me five million pounds, is Mrs Gorman going to get 500,000 pounds on the grounds that she uses it ten times less than I do? <laughs> I mean, that is true, but it can't be... It can't be how it works, can it? Sometimes you'll, you'll see these kind of badly targeted messages on Twitter. Uh, for example, right, if someone sends a tweet like this, uh, a tweet saying, living in Stourbridge, Walsall, Hales Owen, Quinton, Bearwood, Blackheath, Dudley, Tipton. Get down to Kebub, West Brom. Great food. Call 0121 500 6211. That makes sense if you're a food reviewer from the West Midlands. It makes sense if you just live in the West Midlands and just want to recommend a restaurant to your friends. But it would be odd to tweet that if you had 3.4 million followers all over the country and beyond and had never visited the restaurant. Which is why I was surprised to discover that this tweet was sent by none other than Alan Sugar. <laughs> when I saw that, I thought his account had been hacked. Is he accidentally tweeting the script for a radio commercial he's recording? What's he doing? Why is an international business tycoon telling 3.4 million people, an overwhelming majority of whom do not live in the West Midlands, about a kebab restaurant in West Brom? I think I know what he's doing. And I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what I think he's doing when we come back from this short break. Hey. Hey. Well, 
Welcome back to Modern Life is Goodish. I'm Dave Gorman, and before the break, I was showing you a tweet from Alan Sugar, Lord Sugar, in which he was recommending to his 3.4 million Twitter followers worldwide a kebab restaurant near Birmingham. Now, I'm going to tell you why I think he's doing it, but before that, I want to explain why I happened to notice that tweet in the first place and why I happen to be following Alan Sugar on Twitter. You see, myself and Alan, we've got a bit of history. <laughs> Last year, during the first series, I mentioned him in one of the episodes. You don't need to have seen it to understand where I'm going, but I'll just give you a very quick recap so that we're all up to speed. Now, amongst his many business interests is a company called Amscreen. They provide these digital advertising screens that you often see in petrol stations above the till, uh, like this. That's one I took a photo of last year. Last year, Amscreen was heavily featured in a news story that spread all across the world. It was in loads of different papers. That's just an example. It was in the sun there. Uh, the story is that a girl has hired one of the Anne screens on Valentine's Day to send a message to her boyfriend to tell him that she's dumping him. Now, I saw that, and I immediately thought, that is not true. There were half a dozen telltale signs that this was made-up PR guff. The details are unimportant right now. The point is, I thought I would test the idea that you could hire an Anne screen to send a vaguely unpleasant message to one individual. So I went to their website. The company might be called Amscreen, but the website is called linklocal.co.uk. And I filled in a cheeky message to send to this chap. <laughs> my message went as follows. Dear Sir Alan Lord Sugar, one of my mum's friends used to have one of your Amstrad emailers. I'm not going to lie, it was an awful bit of kit. That's all it was. I paid to have my message displayed on the AM screen at this petrol station, which is in Chigwell in Essex, because that is where this man lives. They took my money. I thought, well, hey, I'm in. And immediately headed out on a train to Chigwell to see my message being displayed in all its glory. But I wasn't in. Half an hour into my journey, I got an email on my phone saying, we've decided to decline your advert as it has failed our internal procedures and we will refund your money, which they did eventually. So I was forced into finding another way to get my message across. <laughs> now, now, I was being cheeky, I know. I was being a bit childish. But Alan Sugar, he took it in good humour, and that kind of endeared him to me. I liked him. The day after it had been on the telly, his son Simon, the oldest of his sugar lumps, he runs the, <laughs> he runs the Amscreen branch of the Empire, he sent me a tweet saying, uh, at Dave Gorman, myself and at Lord Sugar, enjoyed the show last night, along with a lot of others based on Link Local inquiries today. So they took it in good humour, and I thought, oh, I like you, you're all right. And I thought, you know what, I will follow him, I'll stay in touch, and so I did. And that is why I happened to see him suddenly tweeting about a kebab shop in the West Midlands. <laughs> now, you might think, well, maybe he just popped in and enjoyed the food, thought as an act of generosity. I'll recommend that to the masses. But I don't think that that is what was going on here. Because on another occasion, he tweeted this. West Brom, New Year treat. <laughs> Try the new place called Kebab. Located in 34 Bromford Lane, B77HW, telephone, all the rest of the details. He keeps doing it. Top quality, he adds. And on another occasion, this. West Brom alert! <laughs> <laughs> it's like he's sending a bat signal into the sky, isn't it, from Lord Sugar? The West Brom alert! We know what this is going to be. I'm told, new place, kebab, located. We know the details, we know the details. Great food and the place to go. There's definitely something going on here, isn't there? But I've been through his tweets, and I think I've found a couple of clues. There's this. Owner of Sheesh Chigwell has opened a new place called Kebab. Six pound a kebab, two pound a beer. Located at Yes We Know All The Details. <laughs> and there's also this. Owner of successful Sheesh in Chigwell, now open in West Brom. Kebab, located in etc, etc, etc. Surely, Chigwell is going to be the answer. Sheesh in Chigwell is the key. So I googled it to see if I could find out who owns Sheesh. And I found this review in The Spectator, which describes it as Alan Sugar's Turkish <laughs> restaurant, Sheesh in Chigwell. In The Independent, there was this review, which describes it as Lord Sugar's Essex Gastropub. 
And then there was this in The Observer, where Jay Rayner says there's nothing shy about Alan Sugar's sheesh. All these people are suggesting that he is the owner of sheesh in Chigwell, and he's saying the owner of sheesh in Chigwell has opened a new place in West Bromwich, and I highly recommend it. I mean, somebody, somebody did challenge him about this on Twitter. That's one of his tweets about the place, to which somebody replies saying, God, you got shares in this gaff, all the promotion stuff. Somebody else joined in, saying he owns the venue for an excellent kebab restaurant in Essex, so I expect he has something to do with this. To which he replied, I own neither. <laughs> to which they replied, so you don't own the building that Sheesh is in? To which he replied, nothing. <laughs> that was the end of that conversation. Now, I've looked into it, and the truth of this, and it's important we get the truth, is that he does not own those restaurants. They are not his restaurants. But he is being a bit disingenuous because he owns the building and he leases it to the people who run Shish. So he obviously knows them. And I think that's important. I think when you're saying, I'm told it's great food, it's important to say, by the man who owns it. <laughs> that's like saying, I'm told McDonald's has great food and neglecting to mention the fact that the man who told you looks like that. <laughs> if a man who looks like that tells you that McDonald's is brilliant, take it with a pinch of salt. Or don't, actually. That's probably making it even worse for you. <laughs> it's not actually dishonest, but it's not quite the level of honesty that I think we should expect from a lord. I thought this was worthy of investigation, so I thought I'll pop down to Sheesh and just see what it's like. That is Sheesh. It's a lovely, genuine old Tudor building. Um, and I was a bit concerned, because I wanted to go, but I don't have a car. I live in London, but there's no point where I live. Uh, and in one of the reviews in The Spectator, it says here, you buzz to enter the car park. Whether you can enter on legs, I seriously doubt. So I don't want to go in on the train and then find myself turned away because I can't get into the car park. And I'll, I'll have to get a lift from a friend. Uh, so I've got a friend, a guy called Troy, uh, to give me a lift. There's the gates you have to buzz yourself into. Um, and... <laughs> Troy and me turning up. Um, there I am, having a, I'm having a lovely day out at that point. They buzzed us in, no trouble at all. And I'll tell you what, it's a bit blingy. It's a bit like the inside of Colleen Rooney's handbag, I imagine. But the food's quite nice. And the younger staff, they all got a bit excited when we turned up. They all ran out to take a picture of the van and things on their phone. Two or three of them did. And then the older staff, they looked a bit more perturbed. There was a bit of walking in and out of rooms and coming out with a phone to your ear. And that could have been about anything. I will never know what they were actually talking about or being concerned about. All I know is that I was um, halfway through my starter. Troy, he's very precious with the van. He doesn't like to leave it. He said, no, no I'll, I'll just stay here. You go and enjoy yourself. I don't mind. I'll just be your ride. Uh, and he sent me a, a message later because they'd come out and said, sorry, you're going to have to move the van. You can't park here. And he sent me a little text saying, oh, they've asked me to move. Um, I don't know what's up. And I suddenly thought, God, you know what? What have we done? You've been driving around with that poster on the van for a year, Troy. You know, when you see something every day, you stop noticing the detail. It's just become, that's just the van. Oh, my life, we've turned up at a building he owns. We, thought we look like we're being rude. Honestly, I'm embarrassed. We shouldn't have done that. Troy, seriously, go away. Use your initiative. Take the banner down. Go away and use your initiative. So he did. He, he took the banner off and, and he left. Um, and I said, just, you know, change it up. Do something nicer and come back when you're done. And he's a, he's a lovely lad. He's, he's, he's good to his word. He's a very quick worker. Uh, he came back about half an hour later. <laughs> um, I mean, he, he can't get upset about that. He can't get upset about that, can he? Now, we are going to have a little break, ladies and gentlemen, and if during this commercial break you see a commercial for Alan Sugar's Yum Yums, <laughs> then he is three times the businessman I thought he was. <laughs> we'll see you shortly. Welcome back to Modern Life is Goodish. I'm Dave Gorman, and I want to start this part with a question. How do you know when it's the first day of spring? There are different ways of deciding. There's religious calendars, scientific calendars. Sometimes it's the weather. It's all sorts of different things. For some people, it's when they hear the first cuckoo. For others, it's the first daffodil in their own flower bed, and so on. For me, though, 
Every year, the day I think, ah, spring has sprung, is the day that I see all the local newspapers starting to write their dogging stories. Yeah? <laughs> happens every year, early March. It's a lovely little tradition, isn't it? They all start doing it. It happened this year, the same as it always does. Uh, there you go. The Seven Oaks Chronicle went with this. Seven Oaks dogging sites revealed woods and picnic spots on list of public sex sites. That's on March the 9th. So I knew spring had sprung in Seven Oaks. Uh, here's the Derby Telegraph, uh, March the 8th. Dogging in Derbyshire, Mark Eaton Park and Ulstree Park, named in online list. Uh, the Surrey Mirror, they were doing it on the 6th of March. Dogging, Surrey, open air sex sites revealed. Crawley News. Yeah? Sussex dogging sites revealed, picnic spots, beaches at cricket fields on public sex lists. Cornish Guardian, yeah? National Trust sites among dogging spots. They were a bit earlier, March the 5th, which of course makes sense because it's spring and the warm weather does start in the south and <laughs> make its way up the country, doesn't it? Yeah? Which explains also why these were early, the Plymouth Herald, also on March the 5th. Plymouth dogging sites revealed, parks and beauty spots on public sex lists. This is a hell of a coincidence, isn't it? All these different local newspapers running stories, basically saying there is dogging going on in our local community, all within three or four days of one another. That is a hell of a coincidence. It's even more coincidental when you read the stories. Have a look at two of them side by side. The Herald in Plymouth and the Crawley News. Hundreds of miles apart, these two local newspapers. Let's look at their two stories. First paragraph. A popular park and an historic beauty spot have been named on a list of sites where strangers meet for sex in front of spectators versus, on the right, woods, beaches, picnic spots and even a cricket pitch have been named on a list of locations in Sussex where strangers meet for sex in front of a watching audience. So basically, apart from the actual places which are obviously local and specific, they've just swapped the phrase locations in Sussex in for the word sites and they've swapped a watching audience in for the phrase spectators. But apart from that, those sentences are pretty much the same. Paragraph two. The underground practice, known as dogging, involves people performing sex acts in cars or in secluded spots while others watch, versus known as dogging, the underground practice involves people performing sex acts in cars or in secluded spots while others watch. Third paragraph, on the left, those who take part claim the activity falls through a legal loophole because it is not an offence to have sex in public unless it causes outrage to a witness. Third paragraph in Crawley, the activity is understood to fall through a legal loophole because it's not an offence to have sex in public unless it causes outrage to a witness. And incidentally, that's not even true. It is an offence if it is likely to cause outrage to a witness. You don't need to have an actual witness there who is being outraged. Don't ask me how I know, I just know. <laughs> I just know. Paragraph four, participants often meet and share information online and several websites contain lists of popular dogging locations across the region. Participants often tip each other off about popular spots and now online lists have even been compiled. These include Central Park, Devil's Point, Jennycliffe, Thorn Park in Manamede and car parks in Arverbridge and Plimpton, in and around Crawley, Tilgate Park is listed on several websites and you get the idea. It's the same structure with all the same sentences in the middle, bookended by a bit of local information. If you were a teacher and two students handed in these two essays, you would be calling them in to have a little chat about how they had colluded here and about why they were writing essays about dogging. <laughs> this is too much for a coincidence, isn't it? And it becomes even more obvious that it's not a coincidence when you look at their websites in detail. For example, that is the Crawley News website, OK? And that is the Plymouth Herald. If you put them there, just the banner for the Herald, and then just put the banner for the Crawley News up, you can see they are identical apart from the colour and the title of the newspaper and the fact that it's a little bit warmer in Plymouth. Basically, that's it. If you have a look at the right-hand side of the website, just see where the more news headlines and the classifieds are, and put that side by side. They are basically working from the same template, aren't they? And there is a reason for this. These are all controlled by the same organisation. It's a business called Local World, which is a brilliant name for a business because it sounds like the most disappointing theme park ever. <laughs> There's the Herald website, there's the Crawley News. That's pretty much the same thing. And if you look at all of them, Derby Telegraph, Seven Oaks Chronicle, Surrey Mirror, South Wales Evening Post, you see that they're all working from the same template. You can see in the, the South Wales Evening Post where they've gone with this, they've pointed out that you, you flash your lights to signal drivers and it kind of matches the picture that they've used. Uh, there are two main approaches to the picture that they choose. Uh, some of them, like Derby, Seven Oaks and Surrey, they use a picture of one of the car parks. 
And I guess the point there is they're kind of going, well, you live here, you know what this area is like, this is a beauty spot you might like to visit, you probably don't want to see it blighted by this kind of seedy goings on. That makes sense. The other approach uh, is this one, the Plymouth Herald, uh, the Crawley News and the South Wales Evening Post have gone for sort of dark, moody, seedy pictures depicting the crime, the kind of mood and tenor of it. And you're meant to think, oh, oh, that's spooky, that's horrible, yeah. There is a third approach. Uh, it's taken by the Maystone and Medway News, uh, which is... Fwoa! Hey? Fwoa! Hey, look at that, lads, hey? Fwoa! That's not how local news should be covering dogging, is it? That's a bit weird, isn't it? Now, there is lots of ways in which people get confused about the boundaries of what is local, what is national. One of them happens all the time, happens quite regularly. You sit in the papers every two or three months. There'll be a story about someone like this girl. It's in the Telegraph uh, travel section. She's gone on holiday and she hasn't realised that her phone's going to be much more expensive when she's on roaming charges. Uh, Carissa Grice, her name is. Uh, she got a bill of nearly £3,000 on her mum's phone because she was looking at Facebook while she was on holiday in Turkey for two weeks. She's a nail technician. Uh, there it is, even all the Australian news got onto it, although they've translated it into Aussie dollars for you there. Um, quite a weird story there. 630 megabytes, these are the key details for you. Carissa Grice, she's a nail technician. Uh, and it worked for her, getting all this stuff in the papers, because she had her bill reduced. She was on Twitter saying, phone bill has been knocked down to £250. And I have to have my photo taken for the London newspaper. Hashtag no more debt, hashtag how do I do it. It worked for her, just not in every way. Because not everyone was very sympathetic to Carissa. A pretty girl having been a bit stupid and then getting away with it because she's in the papers. People don't always take kindly to that kind of thing. I don't mind myself, but other people, ooh. I like to see the people who get worked up. I like to see the fervour brewing at the bottom of the internet. I looked at seven or eight different news sources all about this story to see what people were saying about it. I've taken the comments that I found there, ladies and gentlemen, and I've turned them into something that I like to call a found poem, which I would like to perform for you now. Stupid, stupid, stupid. <laughs> Why go on holiday and then waste your time chatting inane garbage on Facebook? You could be on the beach or riding a moped. Just how dim are these people? Very dim, apparently. <laughs> I understand why she wanted to tell her friends about her holly bobs. But you should never tell people you're going on your holly bobs. In case burglars burgle you. Or worse. Being burgled will ruin your holly bobs more than a three grand phone bill will. Open brackets unless they steal less than three grand worth of stuff. <laughs> Obvs. Close brackets. No ways that was just Facebook she was eyeballing. 630 megabytes. That is data, that is. <laughs> she was downloading for show. Daquez is. What was it she downloaded on the download? <laughs> what is a nail technician? <laughs> this is what happens if you insist on holidaying abroad. <laughs> we go to Wales. <laughs> it's technically another country, but one without roaming charges. Yes, she should have known this would happen. But even so, no mobile company can justify these charges. Orange should change their name to red. After the colour their faces should be after this fiasco. In other words, they should be embarrassed. If you can't do the time, don't do the crime. Seriously, I've never heard of a nail technician. <laughs> a fortnight's holiday? Who goes away for that long? <laughs> On a holiday? 
Um, two weeks seems normal enough to me. Yes, two weeks is normal. But it doesn't say two weeks. It says a fortnight. <laughs> Duh. <laughs> so this is what has happened to our once great nation. She's had her bill, but I'll bet she's still tweeting and twerking or whatever it is these young girls do. Three words. Broken Britain. <laughs> Broken Britain. <laughs> Broken Britain. <laughs> I think you'll find this actually happened in Turkey. <laughs> I thank you. <laughs> the Bill Ross Green Quartet, ladies and gentlemen. We'll be back after this short break. Okay, no, it's fine. I'll, no, in which case, I'm going to take advantage of this pause uh, to do something I wasn't sure we were going to have time to do, uh, but it is, I think it is worth doing. Is there anyone here called Sally Deakin? Is there a Sally Deakin here? Hello, Sally. Um, how are you doing? Okay. No, that's good. It's not, don't worry about it. It's nothing, nothing horrible. Would you, would you please stand up, though, Sally? Okay. <laughs> okay, and is there someone here called Dan Wickman? Are you Dan? Yeah. Dan, can you please stand up as well? Um, Sally, uh, Dan got in touch with us before the show. Um, and he wants to know, um, will you marry him? <laughs> Don't put us all through the ringer. Uh, I'm, I'm really sorry. Uh, no. <laughs> um, that, that was a no, Dan. Um, be honest, Dan, you seem quite yeah, relieved I'm, about that. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, quite, it's quite a relief. What, what do you mean? Why, why would you that know, be? I, just, I wasn't quite sure about the whole thing. You weren't sure about the whole thing? No, no. Why did you... What? Well, I hadn't given it a lot of thought until you said it just then. Because you two have never met, have you? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, yeah. But do you know what? Your face was a picture, Dad. It really it was. And, and congratulations, uh, Sally, because uh, it's not really Sally. This is an actress called Cressida. Uh, so well done, Cressida, because that was wonderful. That was very beautiful. Uh, but one, your reaction was fantastic as well. <laughs> it's so, so everyone's involved in this. The only person who wasn't shitting herself then was Cressida. Everyone else. <laughs> and, you know, in a way, if it had gone the other way, you probably would have said yes, wouldn't you, Dan? I can see you. <laughs> well, that's, that's not relevant. Um, oh, by the way, welcome back. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Modern Life is Goodish. I'm Dave Gorman. Uh, now, I didn't make this up just to wind you up, Dan. Uh, well, I did, partly, but it wasn't the only reason. I did this to make a point. You can, you can both sit down and, and relax. I did this. this has actually happened to me a couple of times. I have been asked to propose to somebody in the audience on behalf of somebody else. On both occasions that I've done it, uh, the person has said yes, but on only one of those occasions has it led to a wedding. And if you think about it, they have to say yes. If she gives even the tiniest shit about you, she has to say yes. She's not going to want to humiliate you in front of hundreds of strangers, is she? And the truth is, if you're asking that question, it is one of those questions in life which you need to get an honest answer for. When you ask this question, the pressure should be on you. If you get someone else to ask it in front of a crowd of strangers, you are putting all of that pressure on her. Because what the question should mean is, do you love me enough to spend the rest of your life with me? But by doing it that way, what you're really asking is, do you hate me enough to humiliate me in front of all these strangers? <laughs> if you were on Who Wants to Be a Millionaire and you were facing the hundred pound question, you know when you're at home, that is always piss easy. But you know if you were there in the chair, a little tiny seed of doubt would be in your mind, thinking, I'm about to make a royal tit of myself on television. I might be getting this wrong. And that fear needs to be in you when you're asking someone to marry you. 
And why is this relevant to today's show, I hear you asking? I'll tell you why. Because asking someone to marry you is the most important question you are ever likely to ask someone. But it's a question that I think is deeply personal and that should travel from individual to individual with as little interference as possible. And if you think about it, messages that are travelling at an inappropriate scale are very much the theme of tonight's show. What have we been talking about? About a man who tries to buy ostrich feathers by hoping strangers walking past a window will see a handwritten notice. About a man who hopes to sell steel to random men at football matches. About Lord Alan Sugar recommending a kebab restaurant in West Bromwich to 3.4 million people across the world. And about local papers that aren't always as local as they appear to be. Now, let's be honest. Turning a private proposal into a public spectacle isn't the worst crime in the world. But when you're looking for love, there is a right way to do it and a wrong way to do it. Something that's not always clear to the residents of Maidstone and Medway. <laughs> the way the Maidstone and Medway news covered this story differently, it got me thinking. Because it wasn't just the photo that was out of, out of kilter with all the other papers. Most of the others, they've all done what you'd expect of a local paper. You know, oh, this is an outrageous thing that's happening in our area. It's blighting the beauty spots. It's not safe for the kids. You can't walk your dog. That's what you expect a local paper to do. I would suggest that is the job of a local paper. But that happens when a journalist is writing about it because it's been brought to his attention by the community, when he's showing his initiative and caring about his community. It happens less when the story has been foist upon you, when some overlord has said, here's the story, write this up, here's the template, just fill in the details. In Maystone and Medway, someone has filled in the details but forgotten to stir in the local outrage. You'll see what I mean. I'll go through the entire article as written in the Maystone and Medway News, certainly on their website. Put your hand up if at any point you spot any moral outrage or indignation. Uh, this is their whole article, Maystone and Medway News. Sex mad doggers will be out in force this weekend after one of the most miserable winters on record. <laughs> this might as well be an advert for the local operatic society casting for new members or it's the cricket season, get your whites on and have a go in the village green, it's amazing. With warm and fine weather forecast, outdoor antics is expected to start in earnest for the first time in 2014. Websites are busy with folk looking for no strings liaisons with strangers. Car parks, woods, gold courses, we know what they mean, river banks, beaches and country lanes will be targeted by couples and singletons desperate for open-air sex. One excitable website contributor said, me and the wife will definitely be out at the weekend looking for some action. Probably in Gillingham. <laughs> Another said, the weather's been crap, so it's about time we had some fun. The Mason and Medway News have censored the word crap in an article that is ostensibly recommending dogging. <laughs> this is amazing, isn't it? It goes on. Locations are detailed on the websites with extra information about how to get there. <laughs> oh, that's handy, isn't it? Very handy. Yeah. Should we give it a go, Mary? That's very handy. There's a, a website that'll help out. Detling Hill, Bearstead Golf Course, Pilgrim's Way, Gillingham Riverside Country Park, Maystone's Moat Park, Raynham's Motney Hill Car Park, Rochester Town Centre, all of it, <laughs> all of Rochester Town Centre, a DIY store car park in Chatham are all mentioned on one site alone. A website boasts, dogging sites in England have never been so popular. If you know of any sites for dogging, please list them at the bottom. The most popular dogging sites are very regularly used. If you contact the sites below, then your chances of success are so much greater. That's because it's more convenient for both parties living in UK to hook up and you don't have to worry about travelling costs. The singles and couples are really keen for swingers and dogging in England casual adult fun. Your identity will always stay safe. An opinion that goes unchallenged in the Maystone and Medway news. Your identity will always stay safe. According to this article, it's just good, clean fun. It's safe, here are the locations, it's happening, the weather's getting better. Go on, lads, go for your lives, have some fun. That is the end of the article, ladies and gentlemen. That is every word they wrote on the topic. No moral outrage, no indignation, nothing. What is going on in a local newspaper recommending dogging to its readers? <laughs> Just because someone somewhere up high has gone right up and filled in the details and somebody can't be bothered to even think about what they're doing. But I tell you what, when I read that, it did make me think about dogging in a new light. 
I'd always thought it looked a bit seedy, you know? I don't know what it is about fucking a stranger in a car park <laughs> that's made me think, oh no, that's not quite for me, really. <laughs> it's the other articles, you know, they made it seem a bit dodgy. You read that, and it does sound like it's just a bit of fun, doesn't it? So I thought, you know what? Why not give it a go? <laughs> so I thought I'd go to one of the locations they mentioned, because these are the ones where it sounds like it's fun. I plumped for one of the, uh, one of the ones on the list. As, uh, this is, now look, this is dark. We can't turn up with a camera crew with lights. It's a dogging <laughs> site late at night. And if I ask the producers of the show or the channel I'm working for, am I allowed to do this? They say no. <laughs> so what I do is do it and then say, I've done it, is that all right? And they go, well, all right then. <laughs> um, <laughs> So that's why this is amateur footage and is all dark and dingy. But I've sort of tweaked it on the computer to try and brighten it. And hopefully, if we go in, not, I mean, you can see it's not quite right, but you hopefully can see Riverside Country Park at the top there. Um, and that, as you can see, is one of the locations mentioned in the article. It's Gillingham Riverside Country Park. Now, they are, uh, if I brighten that up, you can see they are concerned about dogging of some kind at that location. Um, <laughs> But no mention of, of the dogging we're here to have a look at. Um, that's the site there. It is all very dark. Um, if I sort of try and brighten up, you can see, hopefully, everyone should be able to see, there is a white car there on the left. Um, some of you, maybe at the back, you can't see it, but there is a black car there. It obviously doesn't stand out as much. Uh, in case anyone can't see it, just to sort of help tune your eyes into the picture. Um, LAUGHTER I've sort of drawn that. Uh, what was happening is there, there were two men there, not talking to each other, not engaging one another, just both sitting in their cars. Uh, there was a guy there. Um, he wasn't actually yawning, it's just a picture I've drawn. Um, and there was a guy there who was actually on his phone, so I've added that. Um, you know, that, that's what was happening. Just two guys sitting in a car park in Gillingham Riverside Country Park. Uh, and obviously I'm there as well. The thing is with dogging, um, you can't really turn up on foot, can you? It's very much a vehicle-based activity. And I don't have a car. Um, <laughs> so... I... I had to call on a friend um, <laughs> to give me a lift. <laughs> and of course, because I've read the South Wales Evening Post, I know what you've got to do to get their attention. Uh, and, <laughs> and what happened shortly after that is, is that those cars left. <laughs> And you know what, like, uh, me and a friend, we secretly filmed this. Do you know what I really genuinely wish I had secretly filmed? It's the meeting I had with the channel about me showing this. Because <laughs> I've had to sit in a room with a lawyer who said, are you suggesting that Alan Sugar goes dogging? <laughs> no! No, if he did and he went in that, what kind of idiot would that make him? What kind of weird double bluff would that be? Imagine Alan Sugar wants to go dogging, he's like, Troy, get the yum yum van, we're going, come on. It can't possibly be the case, can it? <laughs> I've, I've just made a classic mistake there. I've carried on talking when clearly the last words of any show should always be, Troy, get the yum yum van. That, <laughs> you can't go on beyond yum yum van. <laughs> Uh, ladies and gentlemen, however, put that aside, because I think together, we, it's you, me, my mate Troy, <laughs> Lord Sugar, two frustrated men in Gillingham, <laughs> we've all proved that once again, that modern life is indeed goodish. Thanks very much for watching. Good night.